So on YouTube is already um, no, I don't see it. I need to send you just a one upload score let me send you one. Oh you completely changed the channel. No no I just wanna say yeah it's a different link. Okay, send it to me. I did. No. no, it's not here. I send you a... Oh, yeah. But why is private? So people cannot see it? Mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's right here. here. Did I send you the same one? No. You send me again? Yeah. <laughs> On Facebook, did you? Yeah, I'm not. Oh, Everybody hear me okay? Here, thank you for the invitation, uh, and thank you to Hurricane Matthew for not landing on Valley directly. Uh, so, a little bit of background on me. I did my PhD at the University of Illinois, um, and about 20 years ago-ish now, uh, that's when I started really getting into using heuristics on really complex infrastructure problems. So, that's where my origin is, and I tried to pick some slides that would be hopefully engaging and somewhat topically relevant to the weather in the region. Uh, I thought that would be fun. Visual analytics, slide obsession I've had for 19 years. Uh, starting back 
to my master's thesis already present. We've been trying to build both collaborative support and use in humans for real problems uh, where they take action. And this idea of trade-offs, vulnerabilities, and stakeholder dependencies in the changing world is a uh, thematic driver in my group. So this is one of my tag uh, visualizations, and I'll narrate how we got to that a little bit. So uh, I was this crazy civil engineering student, and down uh, Matthew was a guy named Dave Goldberg who did something with genetic algorithms, and I thought, hey, I should put that in his class. And then he said, hey, there's this idea of cradle optimality. Like, okay, low cost reliability, that sounds like a very water supply kind of thing. And so I like this idea, right? And who wants to suck in everything, right? That's pretty clear. So you don't want to be worse than everything. It kind of resonated. I felt like I could probably make a case that you don't want to be worse than everything. And so these new algorithms giving you the capability to try to get into these spaces and shift through this and then get your marginal returns, which is interesting because now this interfaces to perception, computation, simulation, the ability to actually simulate these really complex infrastructure systems. And the other interesting thing, I just got a curiosity. So in this one, it's a simple one, right? Reliability of your water size, say your water supply, your, your time. And cost here, Right? You don't really see that. You probably don't think about it much. I'm just kind of curious. I'm going to take my cursor up this straight off curve. Raise your hand where you would pick a point. So, and keep your hand up until I have everybody in here. 98% reliability of your water supply for $11 million. <laughs> everybody. We're moving. Moving. I do want to see hands. I'll stay on the slide the whole for a minute. Not everybody voted. <laughs> but my point is, everybody has different preferences. You have this kind of multi-jurisdictional public planning problem. So one of the policies is that we actually understand the problem itself. The mathematics. We don't, actually. Uh, even when you think we would. Is when you talk to somebody and you say reliability of your water supply, that seems to make a lot more sense than if I come in and say, hey, I'm a guy who does heuristics. Convergence and diversity are really important. And we want to search not just two objectives, but we want to generalize this phenomenon. So we want to search these fun spaces and we want to move your system so your system is one of these red particles and pretend that the best answer for your system is the triangle in this case we have the research triangle here right but one of the keys to our work has been to make this fall to the background and highly visual and interactive which would motivate investment and a willingness to pay they're really excited when they see the end result, but they don't want to talk about population size. So in my group, uh, we've been working for quite a long time. So one of my former PhDs and the lead author of the MLA framework, his dissertation created the hyper heuristic board a bit later. But one of the reasons we created it is because I've never actually successfully solved a real world problem where people are going to implement right the first time and then i had to change the problems and when i changed the problems they changed their properties and in a real situation you can burn a lot of money really really quickly uh in that design cycle so that's one of the reasons we wanted to create a stable solution another interesting thing just in terms of preference and perception <laughs> and how problems change this is a simple example and it goes back to my dissertation but Say you want to monitor the environment, and cost is a proxy for the number of sensors. You, you minimize sensors here. Fine, but you probably don't want to pick that solution because it's bad in terms of the state of the system and its ability to estimate. That's fine. One of the things we don't know a priori, though, is exactly what error you get at each level. 
So setting a constraint is difficult because you have this complex system. But then the next question is, well, there's also risks in the system of whatever you're monitoring. In this case, it's contamination point. And so you add that axis, and you're probably going to change your perception of the trade-offs. Error in quantifying what's in the boom. So again, here, we're trying to minimize costs, minimize error, and red is bad. My point isn't to give you the details, it's that the perception and the preference potentially changes based on the structure of the problem. But not if you can't show somebody the structure of the problem. So this is a little cornucopia of error in my group. And one of the things that happens, but this becomes overwhelming unless you can actually do something with it. So each of those points is a design. In this particular instance, it's a toy problem, only has 33 million possibilities. Right? Where are you going to sample? This is the actual enumerated set. But even in absence, right, of the solution, because you can enumerate this, right? You don't have ambiguity. How do you play with it? This is the way that in the literature people were solving it. So cost versus error. But the problem was the commentary was that's fine, but nobody used this. this. Interesting is really you have a trade off between your trade offs. So, what I've done here is an interactive set, and what I have highlighted is one branch of two objective trade offs that people were using, and another branch of two objective trade offs. Two competing formulations in the literature they're battling. Mine is better, mine is better. So basically, said nobody cares if they both suck. Right? But within this region, when you start to interact with these sets and you have flexibility and you have visual frameworks and you can scale and every one of these dots becomes an actor with a rich amount of geospatial information or simulation information, all of that, it's different. And in reality, there are solutions there. But they're in between the two objective trade-offs that people were talking about. And so it's this workflow. And so what I just illustrated is what we're terming in my group, many objectives is analytics. And there's a lot to how that has been working for us in terms of the elicitation processes and modeling processes to be able to create multiple competing hypotheses of how you frame a problem. So that you would hope you don't have to change the rest of the framework. If you do generalize your ability to go up in dimension and start thinking about these trade-offs, then you have to think about how you're going to facilitate the negotiated selection of something to implement. Contention. Is it okay for everybody to disagree? To put it succinctly, this is largely what we've been trying to do in a variety of contexts. We want to allow people to explore multiple competing problem formulations. So what I tell my students is I don't care if you show me a non-dominated solution. Show me that the problem is non-dominated. And then facilitate learning and allow decision makers to exploit opportunistically discoveries that they can make, which means we new need the software, new visuals, new access to these kinds of spaces. So of this talk, I'll use three examples. So one of my primary collaborators over the last 10 years is the Aerospace Corporation. They're a federally funded research and design center for the US. Their boss is the National Reconnaissance Office and the Air Force. And they oversee all, a lot of the primary space launches and design protocols for the space infrastructure in the United States. For this test case, I kind of want to show that as you develop your software and your support tools, have to be respected. They pose both opportunity and constraints. And in this, when I say operational models, it could be statistical calculation of coverages. It could be physical evaluations of control, all of these kinds of simulations. Most existing workflows reinforce status quo decision making. And so for you to innovate the system, you have to actually break through that status quo. And institutional change requires an integration of the elicitation, computation, and multi-objective feedbacks. In this example, where you have to think about how is this a feedback process that's cost-effective. 
that they can depend on? Does it increase the provenance of an idea where there's both replication and they can trace through why they made what choice, when they made that choice, how the software choices affected that all the way down to the metadata level? Second example, I thought, hey, in the research triangle, so I'll tell you about the water supply here. So the top one is observing floods. I'll talk about that use case from space. I thought that was a little hurricane related. Uh, and the second one is we'll switch. And how do people hear, right? You all have bottled water, right? Which is irrational technically. But <laughs> how in this wet region do they handle the drought? It's not a problem. Do they actually perceive the problem? The way that it exists. And then last is just because you can download it, that's the problem that you're solving. And so a large part of what we do and facilitate it particularly uh, with Dave Hacka's dissertation and MOEA framework and other things is we've been working very hard for very rigorous algorithmic benchmarks. And I'll talk a bit about that. So let's talk about, which we'll get a lot of, rain. Precipitation. So satellites play a very key role. This is actually part of the explosion of science in the United States and globally, actually, 1950s. One of the first things to go up in space was a precipitation satellite. So in this case study, what we're looking at, and it was collaborative with myself, uh, Eric Wood at Princeton University, and a fairly substantial by Eric, our uh, Matt Ferringer at Aerospace Corporation. What are the implications of our aging precipitation observation space infrastructure? It takes decades to spec, design, and launch. Each agency usually has its own, but we do have a portfolio. And thinking about this. So in this, what motivated us was the NRC at the Cato surveys. And in the decadal survey, they highlighted a legitimate concern that we are reaching a tipping point where our Earth science space infrastructure could irreversibly collapse. We can't build it, won't build it fast enough to recover current capability. And that's actually, we're pretty far along that road. So, let's demonstrate the implications of vulnerabilities to our precipitation observation space infrastructure. So, how many of you have looked at Hurricane Matthews track, just out of curiosity, whether underground or, right, that's satellite based. So in flash flooding globally, it's largely uh, satellite based. And for countries that lack the institution and governance that we have here, uh, they depend on the satellites uh, as built by other countries. So the first one is look at the vulnerabilities, the potential uh, within that example. And then the next is, don't just be depressing. If there's bad news there, maybe we should suggest something uh, about a different way that we could think about this. And so discover some different new trend architectures that might reduce cost, increase life cycle, and maximize coverage. We look for the win-win-win. Why it matters, this is one of the longest term global goals is a coordinated portfolio of observation from space. It doesn't necessarily exist. Lots of people meet lots of times from lots of countries to discuss this. So, well, why did I get mixed into this? Because since working basically on a systems integration, collaboration, and software transfer with aerospace corporation, integrating our software into the work of their design cycle. And it started slow and sped up and sped up. But given once we started to succeed in that, is then generalize our relationship. So what are the key things in this? Is this is number one. Talking to the humans, specking the problem, figuring out different candidate versions of the problem, then creating something. How many of you create software for government programs? Anybody? <coughs> They're a little picky. There's an approval process. And then you answer that defense and intelligence. Uh, 
And so they wanted to calculate this objective, but it lives over there in LA, and we want it in Chantilly. And so one of the things that they actually did, in addition to creating, part of creating this API, was creating a whole new division of systems of systems, where they brought those models into an integrated framework. And they invested over five years to do that themselves. The next thing is how do you scale this? Because we're talking about very complex potential simulations that take a lot of time. And they have to invest in this. And then how do you actually do the human computer interaction and decision making and preferences, particularly in contentious problems? And then you have this feedback. So this is sort of the cartoonish version of the MOBA framework and learning. So one of the things that we work at it within this framework is to try to have an algorithm. So actually this algorithm is a framework. We based it uh, at its core, thanks to Kali M on Epsilon Dominance MOEA. The reason we did that is it has an exceedingly efficient architecture that's eminently parallelizable. And then what did we add to it? Well, in a real world problem, we don't know exactly all the properties of every simulation, much less the combined effect and creative space of all simulations. It's very difficult. And when we make small changes to the problem, they can have very large effects on the algorithm. So what we wanted to create is not an algorithm, but a framework that instantiates as a different algorithm for every problem that it solves. And so, and I'll illustrate that a little bit. But one of the big defining traits, and I can't go into all the detail, is that it has different strategies for how it moves through the space, and they compete based on how much dominance they can provide. So this learning feedback, and there are different embedded assumptions, whether you are directional. So if you download an SGA2, you use an SGA2, you assume separability, intrinsically based on SBX. Maybe you don't want to be. Maybe you want to have right? Rotational invariance in the way that you move through the space. Maybe you want to slow down a little bit and go to the mean of the population. You can have a simplex. And so just to illustrate this, you have these feedbacks. And when we work through these feedbacks, this is just a simple uh, illustrative example. So what you have here, you have a landscape. Here is the wrong answer. Over here is the right answer. If you've done anything with the population-based searcher, to do it, converge it to one solution, the wrong solution. And then what I'm showing you is an actual run in this space. You'll know this space, right? You need rotationally invariant operators. Down here are the probabilities of how it's using these different combined operators. One of the interesting things is we thought there would be one dominant operator, but actually it uses different combinations and different parts of the space. What's my point here is in real world problems, actually, for example, at aerospace, you can burn a million dollars very quickly in terms of overhead. It's not just computational cost, time of an engineer, time of a design team. And so if they're going to have this iterative hypothesis driven design flow, they need to be able to change flexibly. And it's not to say that this is a solve all, but it gives them a bit more freedom. The other thing that we concentrate on is iron, because it depends on if you substitute for them the cost of the computation versus the cost of the staff time of their top design team, they're not even comparable. It's not to replace them, it's to accelerate them. How fast can we get them to an insight? Question. So we have different variants of Borg, and you can go and you can request it, borgmoa.org, and you get the serial, and included in that is a simple master-slave, a little more fun, which is we have instances that co-evolve with each other in feedback, so when one instance struggles, the top instance actually sees that in terms of its dominance performance and will help them. Why would we go like this? This is a scale all the way up to theoretical exascale. And 
What you see here is basically we created a discrete event simulation of the algorithm that takes timings from supercomputing platforms. It's the Markovian, complicated, based on happening in that. And then we can predict within about 0.01% the naive speed up of different configurations because you have a kind of want to burn all your time. You have to compete nationally for these kinds of allocations. And in this particular study, I said naive speed up. That just means that it's doing linear speed up of the number of model evaluations it can do. It didn't say anything about the quality of what you're getting. The other reason it's the multi-master is because it changes the probability of success. So what we have here is the elapsed time of a run. Challenging problem. Just to go a little context for this problem, the random baseline. A Latin hyper-Q sample average a 1 in 500,000 chance of generating a feasible solution. So it's relatively challenging. You have hypervolume here. The ideal algorithm minimizing time. This is variability across seeds, variability in performance. And as you see, the CDF shifting is going from 500 for one master all the way down to 1,024 cooperating masters on 524,000 which means that this problem largely caused most modern MOEAs to fail uh, for a variety of reasons. And what you have is that failure probability shifting in time. So you're faster and you're more reliable in your algorithmic output. Why? Because this is a hard problem, the different problems that we're looking at. And if you think about constellation design, you have all sorts of interesting problems. As you design, so you have your current constellation, it has some configuration, these steps matter, so you want to build it up, a complex portfolio, a delay in launch, changes all your initial conditions, changes all your calculations, so you have to figure that out. You may have to reconfigure, and then over its life cycle, figuring out replenishment. So it's a dynamic and adaptive design problem. This idea of the first, uh, in this set of examples, the first is, here's the full global portfolio of satellites, at least it was as of 2015. So this is aged out. Some of them have already died. Uh, so there's 10, they're across governments and across agencies within a single government. These are beyond their design life. One of the interesting things that they don't know, so all of these got designed with coverage metrics from aerospace engineers, which is the geometric coverage of how long is a satellite going to stay in a location versus how many locations we can see. Uh, Water is involved in rain, right? The water cycle, things like that. One of the challenges is in their objectives, they, they are not deep to the domain science to know what baseline, how does that relate? So one of the things we did is we did the largest Monte Carlo of the hydrologic water cycle for the globe. We did 10,000 members at one degree, generating two petabytes of data. That's a whole other talk. What did that allow us to do? That allowed us to create a coverage metric. So we went through those 10,000 members and we looked for which one of those actually performed well within the limits of our ability to observe flood. And then we did a virtual experiment where we started coarsening our best available precipitation like we're losing satellites. So we get less and less and less observations. How stable is our prediction? In this particular case, you don't have to be an expert, but this was our target to be able to do flood forecast. At this accuracy, you can trust that little National Weather Service that tells you that flood's coming. So, interesting. This is highly, highly optimistic. The only thing that we require here, we assume for the whole portfolio, that all the information is perfectly coordinated, that geometric view from space is perfect data. That's pretty optimistic. 
None of that's true, right? They have sensor limits, they have coordination challenges, they have all that. So is that boring? So this is basically how much coverage more is bad, brown is bad. This is a deficit. It's saying, oh, we have a flood, but we found out about it eight hours late. So in this particular case, you have the time delay between rainfall data we need and what we can get. Brown is bad. This is super, super optimistic baseline that they had never seen. It changes their objective. It also makes this problem extremely difficult. And gray is where we don't have enough information to comment, which is actually a, a headline onto itself. And what you see here is it's sort of bad news given how optimistic we were in that coverage metric. And this is what it looks like when we turn off the four tending towards collapse. So this is actually quite bad. Uh, and other areas where it's gray, it's probably bad there too, but our other stuff is so bad, we can't comment on why this is bad. So you have a systems of systems problem here. Governance, observations, investment, global, I gave a congressional briefing related to this. How do you make this relevant to the zip code of a representative? And oh, by the way, I use MOEA. So here's an interesting thing. Here is number of satellites. This is going back to that kind of proxy sensor problem. You want to use less sensors, it's just these are billion dollar toys. So you'd like to use as few of these as possible. So we changed the game a little bit and just said, what if we coordinated and optimize this as if it were a portfolio instead of one at a time and wholly independent decision making? That's where the full portfolio starts in terms of its coverage deficit. You'd like to minimize. Arrows are showing your direction of preference. This is where you end up when you lose the four satellites. And if you do full coordination, you can show that eight satellites outperform 10 satellites. So that's a few billion dollars in regret from a lack of coordination at the international level. And that doesn't quantify any of the damages or any of the other economic effects. That's kind of a problem. I started this off with this concept of dominance. Sometimes dominance put in context Changes perspective. I got attention for like two seconds. Right? NSF was all happy, front page. Uh, but it was in a drought in the United States, so I didn't get any press there. But there were floods other, other places, so they were interested in this. Also, these places tend to not have the economic stability to have their own full portfolio. And so the places that we're covering it either are interested in these kinds of bringing their own space programs up or face their own risks. But this is not easy. We did that coordination problem, and to do that coordination problem is non-trivial. You have a set. These are the design decision variables for a satellite. I'm not going to get on the detail. They're dependent. And you translate the dynamics here into conflicting measures. Minimum daily access, daily visibility time, cumulative accesses, worst case coverages, Best case coverages, and all of these tend to have Pareto conflict. So one of the things that we've been working on very hard from a software standpoint is to make sure that this integrates to their design tools. So yes, each cone is a design, but it doesn't really feel like a design unless they can look at the design and interact with it and interplay. And even more importantly, take their best design and put it into this space. And one of the interesting things here is you have two different versions of the same problem from two different teams. The formulations are slightly different. 
the decision vectors are the same, but the way they implement it, and the objectives are the same, but the way they implement it is different. So now you're talking about a trade off across your formulation. So these solutions are moving across two different formulations interactive design. So one of the things, just to finish off, we didn't want to be completely uh, downers for this particular thing. So why not try to have something that might be optimistic, not in a cute, mean way. And so one of the interesting things is if you looked from space down at Earth at low Earth orbit, it would look like a giant junk pile. Right? There is a lot of stuff there and more stuff every day. So one of the interesting things is you move up out of that elevation, actually you get more and more nonlinear perturbations that you have to contend with, basically the physics and the simulation, exploding complexity and computation of man. So it gets very, very difficult. And so actually DRAIN patented the minimum number of satellites that you can use, the DRAIN coverage, for whole Earth coverage for the drain portfolio, and no one has ever built it. Why? Because it dies very quickly. It uses optimistic and unrealistic representations of the physics. Nonlinear perturbations start to accumulate very quickly, and you lose 60 to 70 percent of the performance very quickly, which means you'd have to put more propellant on, and folks down on Earth would have to actively manage it. So, an explosion of cost. So in this particular case, we wanted to see, well, what if we actually use the MOEA to search for initial conditions such that we be from the oblate spheroid mass distribution of Earth, not ideal, from tides, from relativity relationships, drag, third body effect, so that we have a passively controlled constellation that doesn't require propulsion and controls itself. Kind of a hard nonlinear problem. The original drain simulation to evaluate one design would take minutes. When they initially posed this with me, their simulation framework would have taken three weeks for one design. So one of the major things that they had to work on was actually innovating the solver. And they brought that down by two orders of magnitude, just with physics and insight and the way that they're formulating the problem. I can't go into huge amounts of detail, but other to say that we did get some interesting things. Blue means trivial amounts of propellant required. We didn't get perfect, but we got pretty good. Blue represents a lack of less than 60 minutes of coverage gaps over 10 years in the worst case which means you now have a design cycle and lifetime for a constellation of coverage to go beyond 15 minutes and it has a very low launch cost. Systems integration, bringing simulations together, having the right framework, knowing how to frame problems, having the right experts come in and change the insights and the problem itself. The computing, the hypotheses, crazy people willing to do Difficult problem. So that was the first set of examples. So that was the flood component of this particular. If I am a water guy, at least I espouse to be. The second is let's talk about the water where we're at right now. So we're in Raleigh. They have neighbors. Neighbors also like water. So in this particular case, this is demonstrating the way what I'm not going to go through this full thing, but a lot of what we do now is robust decision making. And that, to put that in some note version, what if I lie to you when I show you the trade off surface and it changes dramatically if any of my assumptions were wrong? Or if I change the problem formulation itself because there's some component that you're neglecting. So I'll demonstrate how changing the problem formulation changes the perspective. One of the other interesting things is I have ROS. So in water supply, it's a rate. Ability to give people water. 
demand is how much they want water. If you were risk neutral, you would, and you want to do optimal, you would deliver just right on time exactly the amount of water they want. That's not how it works. We have no control over the cloud, control over the demand, price regulated system, contentious, water is heavy, people argue, right? It's expensive to transport it, energy intensive. So in this particular case, actually we're not optimizing what Raleigh or Durham or Terry are gonna do in 2018 on Thursday. What we're looking for is relative in that race of capacity to demand, what's the likelihood of failure based on how they make choices and then provide them rules that they can apply over the complex time series. It reduces dimension, creates something that's very similar to what they use operationally because they're looking at these kinds of pieces of data on a week-to-week -week basis. The other thing is they said, hey, in this particular project, we don't want to build anything between now and 2025. Is that possible? The multi-objective search in this has been critical in terms of understanding the system and actually helping them to understand the system. There is a huge status quo bias in this in terms of the way they solve the problem, and I'll talk about that a little bit more. But first, I'll set some context of why us discussing this in Raleigh is kind of cute and fun, but at the same time, maybe representative of something broader. If you didn't know, so this is what it looks like. In the United States, the stability of your infrastructure is related to your financial rating. Most public infrastructure entities are price regulated public bodies and their primary concern is debt on their infrastructure. They're good at annualized payment. They're not good at volatility in that. And what do you see here? These are all of the utilities that are large enough to get a Moody's rating distributed through the United States. You can see population centers. So these population centers are doing independent planning for uh, shared and sometimes limited resources. There's another component to this. This is when Moody's is in a bad mood. They knock on your door, comes in, looks at your bank, checking account, looks at your inflows, your outflows, and says, you're really not saving sufficiently, you're exposed. I'm going to raise your house mortgage by 4%. Except for instead of it being a house mortgage, it may be a portfolio of a billion dollars of income. So this is actually the threshold for what is considered financial failure. And it's highly dynamic. This is where they send a very strong warning and potential downgrade. And when you're looking at this, just a fun time series. But anybody know what happened in 2009? Great recession, a lack of liquidity, and they stockpile money for worst case scenarios, but it's a public price regulated future. There's also schools, police, other concerns. But if you stockpile cash for one issue, you can't use it for another issue. And so you can be downgraded. I'm not saying that's the sole reason for this, but that didn't help. This is not an uncertainty that they put in their model. Macroeconomic collapse. And let's go here. So, welcome to the research triangle. They're trying to learn, and they're very progressive here in this region, actually. Quite impressive. Great partners to work with. They're trying to figure out how to transition from the implicit assumption of water abundance to scarcity. And it's not necessarily that a big drought matters. A little drought matters when you have a big population. The bubbles are the size of how much supply they have. So Terry has a lot, it's next to Jordan Lake. Jordan Lake is currently catching what's happening outside, flood control. Raleigh is the center and the largest population. We have their own 
Owasa, you can substitute Capitol Hill and Pablo, most progressive, smallest area. This is their demands. So you can see there's a mismatch in terms of capacity. So this has the highest demand for Raleigh, but they don't have the biggest bubble. So you have this potential where the storage demand ratios may allow for them to use transfers or share those treated water, create cooperation and more efficiency. So in this particular test case, the 2025 utilities seek cooperative agreements with existing infrastructure from a software development standpoint. Each utility had its own simulation. How many of you think they simulated the other utility? Did they do that in a deterministic or a stochastic accounting for uncertainty framework? Deterministic, right? And there's expenditures, there's difficulties, there's all sorts of reasons why that makes sense for them operationally. Do they have, in between the people who compute reliability versus the people who compute financial stability? No. Does the reliability model have financial stability in it? No. There are between seven to nine reservoirs that are coordinated in this. That's its own thing, U.S. Army Force, federal law, floods, etc. And so one of the biggest and the most difficult parts of this is again on the domain science of systems integration and software integration. And one of the things our team had to do is to do two things clearly and well. We had to pull what they had, we had to respect the expertise they have replicate that, and also expand the ability to simulate the whole system. And it's been a lot of fun. We have lots of data. They've been too amazing, actually. So, options for cooperative agreements. How many of you have stopped watering your lawn? Because somebody told you to, just curious. All right. No, you're a non-responsive crowd or you live somewhere you never have a job. Or you don't have law. Right? Too lazy. So but if you think about this, do utilities like this option? How do they make money? They sell water. Right? It's price regulated, does not just raise the price because that goes to the governing board, mayor, there's a whole political process for that. So it's not that simple per se, but when they're at risk, they're also losing revenue. Water transfers. So this is helping with reliability. You have more water than you need. I need water. How about I buy some water from you? But the likelihood is when that condition is occurring, I'm not selling water like I normally do either. So now I'm not selling water like normal, and I'm buying water. So now your costs become unsafe. Financial instruments are actually two of the best experts in this, I think, globally, Greg Chiraklis and HPZ, uh, UNC Chapel Hill. So they added new decisions for this problem. You pass that to my group, what are designing self-insurance and third-party index insurance for this. And so what you have here is you have risk triggers. This is what I talked about at the beginning. We're not telling them the exact decision that they're going to make in 2018 on Thursday at 3 a.m. We're going to look through many, many instances and look at triggering either a restriction, a transfer, self-mitigation, or this financial transfer, right? And they could do it individually or they could do it collectively in a portfolio of options. They ask them, what risk of failure would they set restriction? What risk of failure do they do uh, transfers? What percentage of their annual revenue do they stock back self-insure? How much do they pass over in a premium to transfer their financial risk? So every utility has this decision and every movement of the knobs affects every other utility. But the initial model, the initial context wouldn't allow you to see that interconnectivity. And you have a tremendous amount of uncertainty and a lot of different factors that make this fairly complex. This is a facilitation process. So the five objectives, we sat in several meetings and over the course 
of, of the project to come to a formulation. So reliability, number of years with a reservoir storage greater than 20 percent. Percent Jordan Lake allocation. This is actually contentious here. This is the last unexploited regional source of supply. Restriction frequency is both political and financial. People don't like to be restricted a lot. And it also costs other people money too. Industrial restrictions, other things. Average financial losses which may separate out the use of the for the average and the end of the worst case. This is another thing that's kind of interesting in this problem. You have a multi-jurisdictional group decision making problem. We need to quantify these objectives. Technically we'd have these for each of them. In this case they suggested a minimax. So basically if we get 99% reliability, that means the worst off utility is at 99% and everybody is better at better. And we did that at cost with the dimensional reduction. To all hydrologists, but it's just an example <coughs> of how people make massive assumptions. This is the red is history. Down here is drought. Right? And so this is the observed record, and this is what they were using in the objective calculation. A is basically about a 40 year old uncertainty technique that everybody has recommended for a very long time. Just one step in uncertainty, just adding something that people know what to do. But one, it's not necessarily easy for a utility to have that expertise and or computational capability. And another thing that changed in addition to integrating the system simulation and that software where they can see the whole and the interacting parts. In this particular case, we move from this assumption to the actual variability in the system. Plastic interdependent risk based dynamic decision policy. Solution in this gets Monte Carlo sampled of different ideologic worlds, and we were nice. We allowed them to specify the best case of their facts, ice, and contacts, discounting. There's all sorts of macroeconomic demands. So all we did is add a little drop of uncertainty. And then we compute the five objectives. Again, this was required. Another point here is I'm not saying that this is required for the utilities know is that we can pass our software to them and they can run at smaller scale informed by the higher scale analysis or exploration services that we're providing. I mentioned this idea of portfolios. There's lots of knobs, and the knobs matter a lot. Just out of curiosity, most people don't know how much money in revenue for a region that's a water supplier. These utilities, approximately average annual revenue from water sales is about $500 million. Volatility in that matter. So, the first thing to do is start with the status quo, which is the scary part. They're only doing demand restrictions, stop water in the lawn and that ramps up. Transfers. And the third party. So they can see how the problem changes. They have to be able to understand how the problem changes. So how do you visualize and communicate? An example of how we've done the briefing. Well, we can put a portfolio for the whole region in this plot. So this is a portfolio, one solution. These are the objectives. The ideal solution is a horizontal line at the bottom. Any movement up is bad. 
So if we if they don't do anything and they just run without restriction, actually they only have about an 8% failure rate for the system, which in utility speak is infinity. And so if they don't accept this, then they have to move down. This is another way that they could implement those knobs. So they're moving forward by 100%, but now they're doing restriction 40% of the time. So that's a big financial loss, both in average and worst case. So how do our problems interact with this? So again, we tax folks, but in terms of orienting, I don't want you to look at one solution. We're, we're looking for the non-dominated problem. So this is the status quo. What happens if we add, well, so we dampen out, we're getting better reliability, less restriction, right? Average cost hasn't exploded, but your worst case cost, which they're really not capable of dealing with, that explodes. This ties to economic theory and other things, but it, that often neglects this. Well, that motivates the financial instruments. There's good news and bad news. You can do those really well, and you can do those really poorly. So a lot more options. But when you're looking at this, you have reliability is blue, but there's a lot of complexity, and any diagonal line shows high trade offs. Adding the third party insurance dampens the variability in this formulation. Like portfolio. Ask them beforehand is how do you run your system? This is it. 99% are greater reliability. We want less than 20% restriction frequency, and we want worst case costs less than 5% in terms of exposure. To see how they want to run their system, and we superimpose this on the problem to itself. Problem one, falsified problem two, and a limited set of formulation three and four exists. The falsification of the status quo. That, that little drop of uncertainty that I added was more consequential than they had anticipated. Now we could add more uncertainties than we have. I'm not going to go into that. But 